basically the, the anti-corruption bodies are paralyzed. Like, yes. It is it is critical and it, it gets more critical with every day of the quarantine and of the epidemic. And all the efforts to resolve it in a diplomatic way do not seem to bring as much progress as, as they should at this point. <laughs> Hi, Angelina. Welcome to Debates Digital. When we last met in Belfast about a year ago, you were talking about the uh, ongoing conflict in Ukraine uh, to an interested audience that already then had uh, sort of started to forget about what was happening in your country, in Ukraine. You said then that one of the main challenges that the country was facing back then was to on the one hand, end the conflict in the eastern parts of the country, in Donbass, and at the same time, reconcile society, uh, not only between uh, Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers, but on both sides of this conflict. What is the situation today? Uh, thank you, Karl Hendrik. Thank you for, for, for having me. Um, indeed, uh, uh, we had a very, um, a very interesting year, as, as everywhere globally, but uh, specifically here um, in Ukraine. Um, actually, on the 9th of December, we will be having a year since the previous meeting in Normandy. Uh, it's, uh, it's a format... Uh, uh, it's a format uh, that includes four sides, um, Ukraine, France, Germany and Russia. And it's a meeting between the presidents that we had a year last year uh, with a newly elected president, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, who actually was elected on the wave of, of hope and um, statements that he has come to end the war. And uh, there were great hopes. And um, actually, the meeting in Normandy also um, seemed like uh, more or less a progress, a step forward. Uh, some things were done, but being here now at this point uh, of time in Ukraine, we can see that, uh, that the war is still there. And only two days ago, another soldier was killed and we still have people killed, even though there is a so-called truce in the East. So we can see that uh, the plan uh, is not really working. Uh, Zelensky um, made, uh, made a promise that uh, he will do everything to end the war in a year. Which year it was, I don't know where to count. But all, all these formats, uh, uh, the Normandy format or especially the Minsk format has been going on for, for a long time. Uh, uh, the conflict in the east of the country seems to be by now a kind of a frozen conflict, just like the, the conflict between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia was uh, a frozen conflict, uh, post-Soviet conflict for a long time. And uh, that was also negotiated in the Minsk format. Now, recently, uh, that conflict, conflict uh, was no longer frozen. It was escalated into a fully-fledged war that lasted for about six weeks. And now Azerbaijan has come out of that uh, conflict as a kind of winner. Does this example uh, resonate in Ukraine in any way? Uh, of course, this conflict was, uh, you know, uh, was followed in Ukraine with great attention. And um, the parallels are obvious. They're all there. And um, <clears throat> Many Ukrainians were, were following this conflict, uh, you know, seeing Azerbaijan as sort of a, you know, country that is trying to win back its territories. And um, uh, I, I won't give you any numbers in, in terms of sociology. I mean, how many Ukrainians are supporting, uh, you know, military and how many um, Ukrainians are supporting diplomatic ways of resolving this conflict. But the majority of Ukrainians do want this war to end. But uh, a part of the society um, that is, I would say, pro-war kind of uh, took this uh, case as an example for Ukraine. That, um, well, look, uh, uh, Azerbaijan was waiting for so long and uh, then they took action and uh, then w they were able to win back not the whole, you know, not the whole Nagorno-Karabakh, but 
quite quite a major part of it. Uh, and uh, Ukraine should think of of acting as well. Uh, that was also that was you know part part of uh, part of society. Um, and this reaction is also quite understandable. Uh, it is it is always there. Uh, but uh, I should say that another focus from from Ukrainian society in terms in context of this conflict was the role of Russia. And uh, in Ukraine uh, and on Ukrainian news, you would um, frequently see uh, what is the role of Russia from both sides. Uh, you would see uh, news reports um, uh, with with the Russian warfare and Russian weapons, uh, say from the Armenian side. Uh, you would see analysis. Um, you know uh, how Russia is trying to um, to influence and um, how Russia is trying to influence this conflict. Ukraine was following Azerbaijan's moves uh, with great attention. You know, as a, as as a as a possible way out, and it's understandable because there's great frustration. There's great frustration, exactly because the conflict is still there, and um, even, all, all the and all the yeah and and all the efforts to resolve it in a diplomatic way do not seem to be as you know do not seem to bring as much progress as as they should at this point. But even if you don't want to uh, put figures onto this uh, opinion polls and so on, but you would say that it's uh, this uh, longing for war is. Uh, it's widespread in Ukrainian society. How is it then in uh, in Parliament among the political parties? Uh, I should say uh, again. Uh, let me let me have um, just a, a short <clears throat> a short insight from from the media that I work for, and I, I work for public broadcaster. Uh, we also had these editorial discussions, and on our side, of course, the focus of, of, of this conflict was the humanitarian side. We, we weren't focusing on, you know, uh, whose territory it is and, and uh, who should, you know, win back what and when. Of course, we were covering, we, we actually made an effort and we traveled both to Armenia and to Azerbaijan. But again, we were, focu we, we were focusing on the humanitarian impact of the conflict. And our job was to show actually what war brings, because this is what we see here in Ukraine. While, while everything, you know, while the political debates are out there in the parliament or in Facebook, you can see people killed, you know, households destroyed and things like that. This is what we brought uh, from, from this conflict as well. I wouldn't say that there is uh, the, the majority of Ukrainians or that the, there is this uh, dominant um, mood among Ukrainians that we should go to war and we should, you know, win back uh, Donbass uh, in a military way. Uh, no, I think, um, uh, I, I think there is... Um, there is a more militaristic, uh, there is a militaristic minority, which you can hear better than the rest of the country that is really tired of this war and that is really waiting for it to end. Um, and every news with, with, you know, with killed, with, with a killed soldier or with an injured volunteer or with an injured uh, local resident uh, is, um, is a very painful one. Yes, so do, you said now that you traveled to uh, Armenia and to Azerbaijan and also gave, so to say, the images of the field, from the fields there. But what is the situation on the ground in Donbass uh, right now? You say there's a truce. Uh, how, uh, how much of a truce is it? Uh, what is the situation on the ground in, in, in Donbass? The situation on the ground is quite critical, even, uh, even though uh, there is no hard fighting, you know, with missiles and artillery and everything. Um, every week or every two weeks, we would receive news with injured or with uh, with, with, with killed, yes. Uh, but um, another part of this um, of this picture is is COVID. And, uh, you know, the, the temporarily uh, occupied territories are are also, you know, struck with with uh, uh, with coronavirus, and um, the the picture is uh, critical because we cannot we cannot get information of we cannot get information about um, 
how many people are sick there. We cannot get information whether they get, you know, uh, whether they have everything they need, you know, starting from simple masks and antiseptics, ending with uh, with medical, you know, with with hardware medical support, and 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 later on with vaccines. Of course, it's a huge question how how you resolve it. And I think at um, at a moment like this, which is critical to every country, this conflict and this situation, you know, is way more critical because you cannot get access to these territories. You cannot get access to, to the people there. You cannot, um, you cannot bring uh, um, sustainable um, help. So um, it is very critical, even though, you know, there is no news about Heart, heart fighting and 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 ar artillery, you know, flying uh, back and forth. Uh, in terms of humanitarian situation, it is it is critical and it it gets more critical with every day of the quarantine and of the epidemic. The conflict uh, uh, between Azerbaijan and Armenia are not uh, is not the only big dramatic uh, event in uh, recent weeks. Uh, there has also been a change of administration in Washington, or at least the beginning of a change of administration in Washington. What uh, does uh, President Biden mean for uh, Ukraine and the conflict between Ukraine and Russia? We were able to see during this year, I mean, basically the year of campaigning uh, in, in the States, that there was huge risk uh, for Ukraine to become to play even uh, a bigger role, you know, in the story. There were active attempts from the Trump uh, administration and from uh, Trump's allies like Rudy Giuliani um, to drag Ukraine in, into the campaign, to make Ukraine open up uh, cases against Biden or Biden's son Hunter, who used to uh, work in Ukraine in one of the biggest uh, private companies. And it's really... Mm, it's 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 really good to see that uh, it didn't go there. Uh, <clears throat> from uh, from from what Ukrainians can 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 learn from this campaign and can uh, and I think it was also one of the focuses that was interesting for Ukrainians is the way the the American society was and to what extent the American society was polarized during this campaign. Um, so. Um, the way the the campaign was handled, what you know, what the Republicans were saying, what the Democrats were saying, um, for the Ukrainians, uh, it was important to see uh, whether there is any common ground between them, whether whether anything that uh, could be in common between th these two sides, because Ukrainian society is also deeply polarized, politically deeply polarized. Um, <clears throat> And the polarization, uh, to my opinion, is is just deepening. Uh, is that polarization about uh, uh, alliances uh, or allegiances, uh, Europe, Russia, or what are the dividing lines? The dividing lines are uh, political. I mean, they are uh, whether you support uh, Poroshenko, who who is uh, still there and acting as a fifth president of Ukraine. <laughs> Uh, and 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 Zelensky, uh, and um, the, the the line there is that everything that is done by another side is is called, you know, as instigated by Kremlin, and um, anything that is made by by another side in terms of you know beat reforms, uh, beat corruption, anything is just the, the Kremlin is there, you know, instantly. But um, uh, there's another thing that um, if we're if we're talking about Ukraine and you know what Ukraine uh, what is the Ukrainian topic number one right now, uh, and it's uh, indeed very troubling. Um, it's 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 the latest development in the anti-corruption sphere. Uh, a month ago, our anti-corruption court uh, made a ruling that um, uh, basically. Um, announced the majority of Ukrainian anti-corruption bodies and activities unconstitutional. It led to huge uh, constitutional crisis because um, um, Zelensky had, um, had to do something with it and the cabinet ruled 
that the anti-corruption, the cabinet of ministers, I mean, the government ruled that the anti-corruption bodies still have to, you know, to do their jobs, which is, again, creates a conflict between the ruling of the, uh, of the constitutional court and the ruling of, of another branch of power. And unfortunately, for the past months, it's, uh, it's actually, it's a month since, since this ruling, uh, nothing was done uh, by the parliament where Zelensky has a predominant majority uh, to, to resolve this crisis. And um, the, the reality in which we live now is that um, basically the, the anti-corruption bodies are paralyzed. Uh, until this constitutional crisis is, is resolved, we are in, in a deep in a deep political crisis, um, uh, the negotiations with the IMF and with the Western, you know, allies and partners also come, uh, also are jeopardized uh, with the steps. It's clear that uh, Ukraine has uh, not a crisis, but a multi-crisis. There's the economic crisis, there's the constitutional crisis, uh, but there's also uh, the crisis in uh, Donbass. What do you see will happen there what is the future of that uh, conflict i i, I wish I, I wish i i would know the the answer i can see that um i really hope that our government and uh i can see that they they are working on the, on efforts i mean when one effort doesn't work there is another coming and it's a good thing but uh on the other hand we can see that um something that ukraine is limited in, in what it can do on, on its own. I mean, there is also, there is for sure, there is a number of things that Ukraine should do on its own without the Normandy allies or, or the US or anyone. But of course, there are hopes now with the new administration coming in the Washington that um, that Ukraine uh, Ukraine will get this support. I mean, I'm not talking about military support or financial support, but first of all, political support in, in resolving this case. Um, as, as, as long as political polarization deepens in Ukraine, uh, it is harder to solve this problem because it is harder for Zelensky to step out with a peace plan. The more um, there is this pro-war, you know, narrative, pro-war statements and politicians out there, the harder it is for him to talk about peace negotiations and things like that. I really hope that it is, um, and I, I think it is the responsibility of the civil society and of the media um, to make this dialogue uh, possible, uh, to make the polarization, I mean, to, um, to create platforms and to create atmosphere in which the dialogue is possible um without that well the everyone is paralyzed and and nothing can be done and the and the frozen conflict which is not really frozen when when people are being killed you know each each week or each month it's it's not so frozen it is still there thank you uh angelina karyakina for reminding us uh, of what is going on uh, in ukraine and for this update uh thanks a lot Thank you indeed, and thank you for uh, for for having uh, me and and Ukrainian perspective.